Hello and welcome to Take a Wonder with Shebs. Now, today I'm looking back at my talk with Catherine Parker Magia. I spoke to Catherine live on my Instagram on the 21st of September 2020, so this is an edited version of our talk. Our discussion was based on how she got started in writing and what it took for her to become successful, uh, some of her travel experiences and what the future holds. And these are some of her photos from her travels. Now you can watch the unedited version on my Instagram. Otherwise, sit back and enjoy. Hi, Catherine. Um, how, how are, are you? you? <laughs> I'm not too bad. The States, you're still quite, you're still quite bad, aren't you? Yeah, so I'm based in Wyoming as of two months ago. And I'm going to be out here for the fall. And usually my, you know, the stories that I would write about for travel would be sort of far-flying destinations. Um, always an emphasis on the outdoors, which works now. But yeah, like I'm really shifting into seeing like what are sort of international comps and domestic travel. So if you would love to ski the Alps, maybe into the big sky. Or I mean, focusing a lot on the American West. There are a lot of travelers even on the East Coast who've never been, like they've been to the Alps, haven't been to the Rockies. So focusing on that, but it's such a weird time for travel. I feel like it changes every week. And it's such an odd limbo period that I feel like will definitely be continuing at least until next year. So you're a freelance travel writer. I believe you were based in New York, but you just said you're based now in Wyoming. Is that correct? Yes, I'm a freelance writer, and my work has been published in Trip Savvy, Architectural Digest, Forbes, Business Insider. And I was based in New York sort of ostensibly, but I was traveling pretty much nonstop for two years. I started travel writing two years ago and just... You know, there are so many places in the world that I want to see, and there's really no place I don't want to go, particularly if I've never mm. been before. And the more I traveled, the more, you know, the more I learned about sort of different areas and different places, and I just took advantage of every opportunity possible, and I'm happy I did, because I traveled like a plague was coming. I predicted that somehow, because now it's the first time I've really been in one place for a while. Yeah. At the beginning, I was quarantined with my whole entire family in New Jersey, and I just got out here to Wyoming and was thinking that, you know, I'm still going to be writing about the trips that I've taken. Like, I think evergreen travel stories, there's still an appetite for it. And just as a journalist, I've never had, like, longer articles are doing really well. People are now online more than ever. They're on their screens more. And I think that there's this sort of fatigue with the virtual travel. And, I mean, the COVID updates change daily. That there is, you know, mm. not every time that I read a travel story am I, like, going to, like, book my flight immediately. Usually you sort of seed an idea or you think about it or you just sort of want an escape. And I feel like those types of escape are like more important now than ever, particularly because like as we're all quarantined and self-isolated and there's so much distrust, you can sort of forget that the world is a beautiful place with really kind, wonderful people in it. Oh, yeah. It's very easy to get very jaded. And I think like spotlighting the areas of the world or the parts of, and tourism obviously is problematic too, like every industry, but there are certain areas of tourism and all across the world that are really helping local communities, preserving local culture, and also are very um, environmentally sustainable. So focusing on those as well still, even though we're sort of landlocked. Yeah, it's interesting. You said you, you couple, only a couple of years ago you started properly mm -hmm. getting into So what did you do before, before you uh, started travel writing? I was the world's worst advertising junior executive ever. I was working in advertising for a while. I didn't really like it. But the idea of becoming a writer, even though my family, my parents were writers and my, and my brother, it just seemed very intimidating, particularly yeah, because yeah. I graduated the sort of the end of print like magazine journalism as it was. And then during those 10 years I was working in advertising, obviously like digital journalism exploded. And I went to yeah. graduate school at the new school in New York, which was wonderful because suddenly I was surrounded by people who are like, I'm a philosopher of Greek antiquity. It's like, all right, if you're a philosopher of Greek antiquity, I can be a writer. So I started out writing. And I know a lot of people, I think, really want to get into travel writing because it is, I think, the most fun kind of writing and Absolutely. you get to travel. But it's really hard to break into at the very beginning. Like, I thought, you know, I'd smuggled by accident a weapon, like, across the Palestinian border. i have been, like, stranded in Istanbul. And I was like, these are great stories. Oh, wow. But I found it hard to place them at the beginning. And so what I would do is I'd just pitch to every editor there is, like multiple stories. And you know, then you start getting little wins. Like at the beginning it was like, oh, I'm in Elite Daily or Pop Sugar. And then it was the week in Arc Digest. And the more that I built out my portfolio and had a portfolio to share, the more I was able to break into the travel sphere. 
which is ultimately what I like best because you can write about so many different things in relation to travel. You can write about politics. You can write about dating. You can write about the environment. Yeah. Um, and I think writing about politics would be really depressing right now, but interesting. <laughs> and dating would also be depressing right now, but very interesting. So I've actually covered dating on my show in the past. Um, because within the industry, um, there's quite a lot of, uh, it's, it's odd to see so many single travelers now. Uh, and, um, and some of the, some of my friends as well, you know, you know, good looking guys, you know, gorgeous girls. And you're like, what you do, what you're still doing single. And, you know, they can't commit because the worry is, you know, if, if I get married, if I have kids, I can't travel. But I, I bought a guest on a couple of months ago. They've got kids and they're traveling full time now with their, with their family. Mm -hmm. uh, so it can be done. Um, it's making the commitment, really. But it, it, it's absolutely true what you said before. You can literally write about anything. It's sort of the more stories that you write that are in the genre that you're interested in, the more stories you're going to be, the more you know, trips will be considered for, but also the more stories will be pitched to you. Like I did this trek in Peru where I hiked to the highest lodges in the world with, um, and it was an REI trek with the Andean lodges and really supports all the communities up there essentially. The money from tourism has allowed them to maintain this way of life. And then from there, you know, I did a trip in Nepal and New Zealand. So that was really my specialty. And now obviously I think those stories are still relevant for people who are, I mean, for me at home, like, there are certain places I w I've wanted to go. Like, I really want to go to Zambia. I was supposed mm. to go to Zambia. But, I, you know, and then I feel like people are focusing on those again. But I think it's interesting what you're saying about traveling and dating. So I feel like when you start to travel and you're really loving it, and for me in my career, like, I felt like I had this, like, really great moment. I would say that, like, oh, yeah, I definitely, like, I want to date someone. But then you actually don't. But I was trying to get you off to scratch. So maybe during COVID, people will have, co people will have safely distanced deep COVID relationships while all the travel <laughs> writers are grounded in one place. Are you seeing someone now or are you? I am. But I mean, I'm out here in Wyoming, so I'm also, I'm also quarantined solo a little bit. So that has been fun. I actually have been doing road trips from here. I went to Big Sky oh, last yeah. week, the spectacular, and, you know, drove through Yellowstone on the way there. And it was just like very safe, very distanced and like yeah. stuff like that that you can do. I also think that trips are going to become longer because more and more people are working remotely sort of yeah, for an extended yeah. period of time. And it's now easier to sort of plan a two-week trip and say you have to work for a certain period or certain days and sort of plan around that. And also now that the emotional cost of, cost of traveling is higher, you know, people are a little bit more worried about it than before. I do believe that people are going to want to make it worth it if they're going to feel like they're endangering themselves in any way. I just want to go back to what you said before. Um, and you said you became a writer uh, only a couple of years ago. I spoke to someone last week. Um, she's been a journalist for, I don't know, 30 years, I think she said. Um, she's written publications for Forbes, CNN. Um, and she said she had no qualifications whatsoever in journalism or anything. She was never a writer, never a photographer, none of these things. And you can literally practice and sort of become a profession at it um, if you put your mind to it. And she was just saying, um, it's perseverance. Because um, you're going to get knocked back, but you know you just keep trying. And as, you, as you said before, you just approach all these editors for publications. And you know, next thing you know, your work's being published with the likes of Forbes, which is you know, one of the biggest companies in the world. So Well, you can't get discouraged. Because honestly, like whether or not an editor takes a pitch, or whether or not honestly, as a journalist, if you take a pitch, it's not personal. You know what I mean? Like, maybe mm. you're pitching a story about, I don't know, like, safaris in South Asia, or like, you know, tiger tracking in Nepal, and they have something on that. Or you just have to keep going, and usually you can tell you can get enough encouragement. For me, whenever I got a story published, I would really write the hell out of it, because that's your calling card as a journalist. Truthfully, everything is online. So, mm you're going to get more articles the more articles you write. So, like, don't wait for the New Yorker to, like, stay up all night and craft the perfect first sentence. Like, I got my start writing for um, Brit & Co. and Elite Daily, Brit & Co. mainly, and, like, Elite Daily, Pop Sugar. And sometimes I'd be meeting other journalists, and they would be sort of dismissive of those publications because they're, like, millennial and geared towards females. But it's, like, mm -hmm. the editors I worked with there were spectacular. And the stories I wrote there are what launched my career. So don't think you're ever, like, don't get discouraged. Don't think you're ever too big for anything. But I do have to say, I got my start as a newspaper reporter in high school and college, and I was an English major, and then I got my master's in literature. 
And it's wonderful when you have perseverance and you do focus and you can, you can really, the more you write, the better you get. I think Hemingway said that like, you know, it's not a skill that you can just dip back into. It's not just like riding a bike, like you sort of have to stay sharp, but the skills that I learned as a newspaper reporter, where there is like the newspapers going to print, you need it. Like, what's the hook? What's the headline? I started out actually writing obituaries, which was very stressful. Uh -huh, okay. People would be like, well, that's the last word on it. You know, you don't want to get it wrong. And I feel like coming up through that traditional publishing realm has helped me in my career. I do. The one thing that I get discouraged about with travel writing is sometimes like, there isn't, and this is just all across the internet and with the intellectual property in general and how much people are paying journalists, but sometimes there just isn't a lot of quality control about, like, if someone's a travel blogger, and sometimes if you read some of these blogs, they're super subjective and mm. not always accurate, and so it's wonderful that just anyone can start writing, but I do think that there is sort of a civic responsibility to try to, I don't know, I try to bring as much, I try to bring all of the, um, structural detail t things that i learned from newspaper reporting the factual yeah. and combine it with the excitement and narrative that is why a lot of travel blogs are so popular so taking that sort of narrative experience which is making it a little bit more accountable and like contextual to other places you just mentioned about how um some blogs can be subjective so it's within ourselves we've got to be very careful in what we write because people will look at that and go you know oh that this is what it's like but it could be completely wrong, you know, have they got it factually right, you know, it's just their opinion. Uh, so what you said, though, going on the objective sort of route, newspaper reporting sort of journalism is still the way really forward. And I also think it's having a knowledge of that. Well, I think that's why the more you travel, the better you are as a travel writer, because you can put it contextually amongst other countries or like compare it to other parts of the world and sort of, you know, it's one thing to be like, well, St. Lucia's mountains are really beautiful by the ocean. But then if you can be like, well, and they, in my opinion, they do sort of look like the like central Andes in Peru. And then you mix that with like the turquoise of the Caribbean and just a way of describing things. And also the more you travel, the more you'll see similarities between different cultures everywhere and cuisine. And ultimately you want to be like, well, if you really like this kind of trip, then you should also do this kind of trip as well. So trying to be able to like make it accessible to first time travelers, but also to people who feel like they've seen a lot and what makes this one part of the country unique. For Ship Savvy, I cover the Caribbean and that's like been a real focus of mine to go to. I've been to like 15 of the islands, island nations. I want to get, there's 32, but like being able to, I'm pretty well traveled in the area and that's like have, has been a focus being able to like identify like what are the distinct differences between like a Barbados and a Jamaica and a Curacao because sometimes you have sometimes journalists will just like well this happens a lot with the Caribbean which I think is like very dismissive and like has like a racist undertone here it's just like oh it's just the beach but there's so much more to it than the beach you know people are just on cruise ships and then they'll go off and every cruise port looks the same and, the, and, you know, they won't be able to like, come away with, like, what makes one place unique. As a journalist, like, it's not my job to go somewhere and not be impressed. Or be like, oh, that was boring. Like, anyone can go somewhere and not have a good, interesting experience. I feel like it's my job as a professional to find out what makes it cool. To find the, And usually it's the people that make it cool. And, like, I'm not saying, you know, hopefully you meet the right person on the street. But there are certain hotels, there are certain tour groups, and... Oftentimes, you know, it's important to focus on things that are locally owned because they usually have the inside scoop and just highlighting these different places around the world because I think sustainability environmentally is important, but I also think that sustainable travel is also a means of preserving local culture and giving back to a local population. So it's not that, you know, the only people getting rich are the owners who live in Europe. So I think mm. that that's something that's a huge focus, was a huge focus before COVID, and I think hopefully after COVID will continue to be as well. Well, what sort of advice would you give someone who's, who's looking to start off writing then? With writing, the biggest thing, the biggest challenge that I had when I became a writer was telling other people I was a writer and like stepping into that role and like feeling confident because I feel like there is this intimidation when you declare yourself a creative of any kind, particularly when mm. you're a freelance writer, you're sort of telling people before you actually are. So you're your own biggest publicist and if you won't share your own stories and like and market your work, then how can you expect anyone else to? But the very first step I would say is to pitch your local newspapers, pitch anywhere and everywhere. There are some, there's like where to pitch.com. There are, I think there's, they're writing websites, but what I would do is like Twitter is a great resource if you want to look up an editor. Yeah. So say you have a great idea 
And, you know, you could. Like, I had one of my earliest stories picked up by the week, which I was really excited about before I had other places. So I'm not saying don't aim super high at the beginning, but just aim everywhere and just start building up. I really think with local newspapers is huge because they are often looking for writers and you are also the expert of that one place. And for travel, if you want to write about travel, a lot of, I mean, there are two like, I, like sort of modes of thought here. One is that locals write the best travel stories because they're local and they know everything. Mm. They know all of but I also think that, you know, my guide to New York City would not be the same as someone who doesn't, who, who doesn't live in or didn't live in New York City. So I feel like you could, be, you could take advantage of the former, particularly in America right now, where everyone's looking for hidden gems. If you want to be a travel writer, identify, like, the one cool museum or the one cool thing about your region, your state, anywhere you've been, and pitch that story. But don't feel that, like, you, like any writing is good. Any any writing will lead you into travel writing. And I've had a lot of opportunities because I do cover a broad swath of topics. So if it's like, I went, I went mm. to the Amazon forest with like all of our guides were um, natives to the, to the Amazon. So cool. Amazon nature tours and was so focused on sustainability. But I also got that. Um, I also got that story lead because I'd written other places actually, like actually about um, Jordan and sort I'm going so off the rails here. But if you write about culture in general and you're looking into like, yeah. and you're going to travel, all of your past work is going to help build you to where you want to go. I've just recently done my own website. You know, I, I, I've told you that I got the role on, on radio purely because of what I've been doing online. Um, your own websites, your own domain, everything is really, really crucial as well, I think. Mm -hmm. That's how you sort of, it, it's a, part, a way of getting noticed. And obviously, as you just said there, pitch to your own local newspapers, local magazines. Um, and as you said, if, you, if you've got your own website and you can write your stuff on there, they'll ask for, have you got any, any, any material that we can read? And you say, yep, yeah, read my, you know, go on my website. Yeah. And I've got lists of, you know, I've got stories of this, this, this. And then next thing you know, they'll actually be quite like the way you've written this and stuff. So um, opportunities are always out there. You just have to I guess believe in yourself and um, always always commit 100% into it as well. A lot of people will, I, I, again, I spoke to another blogger uh, about th two, three weeks ago, about a month ago, I should say. Um, a lot of the time people fail is because they give up after a year, six months. You know, you got to, again, perseverance is the word I always keep hearing, you know, constantly. If, if you don't carry on doing it, persevere. There's going to be tough times you know you're not going to succeed and hard work as well i've noticed i don't know whether it's like a younger generational thing but you don't want to they don't want to work for it and you have to work for it literally you know it's not going to come to you easy i mean it, it, i mean i i shouldn't i mean I, i'm on my travels you know but i've decided to to do the show still you know i can mm -hmm. say you know what forget about it i'm gonna stick to just just traveling and stuff but it, it's making sure you have to work for it <laughs> that's that's the key to it really <laughs> And I mean, it's really hard. I mean, for deciding to go from sort of from a corporate job that had a like health insurance, which thank God I now have again, but like and a career ladder, it's terrifying because you are sort yeah. of going into the unknown. And for me, like I would work like all night. I worked, I still, I feel like I'm, it's hard to get to the point where you feel adequately compensated, but it does begin to happen. But at the beginning, you're writing for very little and you're working very hard. The way that I knew that the reason I kept with it is because the sense of satisfaction that I felt when a story was published, it was just like an escape guide to Turks and Caicos. Oh, like, yeah. I loved it. Like now when I'm like a professional writer all the time, sometimes I'm like, Oh my God, this deadline, like, why do I do this? But I, I really like to write and yeah. it brings me satisfaction. The act of writing and getting published is like, I think Dorothy Parker had like said, you know, I hate writing. I love having written, but when a story is published, it's like you feel accomplished all over again. And if it's a story that matters to you, then you're excited to share it with every single person. And like, I don't know, for me, I'm like, send it to the, like, the tourism bureau of the entire country, just to show, you know, I feel, I feel an immense satisfaction by being able to relay an experience that I feel like is important. But yeah, you have to, you have to accept that it is a lot of rejection, but then the payoff is huge. Yeah. But I say this as someone like I waited until I was 30 to even start. I always knew I was a good writer just from school and like, I liked doing it in grad school, gave me the final push, but it took me until I was so sick of like my career in advertising. I was just like, I don't care about this at all. All I'm doing is making money to travel on the weekends. 
if this doesn't give me any joy anymore, like, I'm going to go for it. If I don't go for it now, I'll never go for it. And I think there's this idea that, like, the 30 under 30, like, everyone's got to get everything done by their 20s. But I find that your 20s are oftentimes, like, a lot of experimentation. Like, the travels I did in my 20s have certainly helped my career. But it wasn't until mm. my 30s that I really started doing exactly what I wanted to be doing. So if you're, like, 29 or even if you're 35, like, there are writers – What's her face? I bet Annie Prue is this amazing novelist from Wyoming. She started writing, I believe, at like 45, you know? So oh, yeah, with yeah. writing, you know, it's never too late to start. And yeah, you have to, if you want to, particularly with travel writing, you have to like writing first and foremost. You have to want to be a writer before you want to be a traveler. Because if you want to be a traveler, quite honestly, there are much more lucrative ways to go about it. And at the end of the day, your job is writing. So mm. the travel is amazing, but, you know, it's all in service of writing. And yeah, you have to enjoy doing that, obviously. It's like the majority of your time. Some of your stories, I've, I've read your website. By the way, you've got an awesome website, uh, to say. Um, your, um, I mean, I can, we can go through a lot of these journeys, but which one would you say was the most transformative uh, travel experience for yourself? When I was, it was the first fall that I started writing, and I'd always wanted to go to Kenya. And I don't know why, okay. because there are also other amazing places. I really want to go to Zambia now, as mentioned, and Rwanda and Uganda. But I'd always really wanted to go to Kenya. And okay. another thing, if you're trying to be a travel writer, just starting out in general in the travel career, like answer every pitch email. Like even if you feel like it's not relevant to you, answer, make connections. And as you mentioned about the website, sometimes it's hard because as a journalist, you know, well, as a freelance writer, I'm only paid when I'm writing. But there's so much more to it that goes into the career than – just writing, but like, yeah, having a professional looking website, it's been probably countless hours on it. But I got connected via um, a meeting I had about Satoki, Japan with Kenya Airways. And I ended up being on the first ever direct flight from New York City to Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And so on this flight, there are all these po Kenyan politicians and then all these amazing journalists from publications right. I look up to. And we landed and I met the deputy president and he told me, welcome home. And the speech he gave was just amazing. So it was a huge moment for like East Africa and American relations, like not just for tourism, but for commerce as well. And he was like, you know, Queen Elizabeth became queen in Kenya. You know, the last president, Barack Obama, his father was born a Kenyan. He was like, but it doesn't matter where you're from, if it's Europe, if it's Asia, if it's South America, Russia, when you come to Kenya, you're coming home. It's the capital of mankind. And that just set the tone for the whole trip. Like we started out in Nairobi, went to Nanyuki, went to Saimara. The people I met were so amazing. And like Kenyan culture is, I mean, I loved it. I mean, it's very self deprecating The humor is very much to make fun of yourself and other people. So I felt like I was just vibing with everyone there. And it was just the most beautiful place I've ever seen. And the story I wrote about that was like, I feel like my first really big travel story that I was really excited about, even though there were others before that, but that remains like that trip. And then my trip to Peru doing the Asangate track, and then my trip in Nepal last fall were probably my three major. Yeah. And then the Amazon rainforest in New Zealand were really great. And the Arctic in Finland. But those, those three, for some reason, I think it's because Kenya, I also like to do an activity when I travel. And I think that a lot of people, they're like, oh my God, yeah, I'm going to explore the town. Or I'm going to do this. But trekking in Peru, like being out there all day, mm. walking, like, you have no choice but to like really bond with the people you're with. And like, it's so immersive. And, in Kenya, you know, you're on safari and you're out there all day, you know what I mean, in the bush. It's amazing. And in Nepal was safari and trekking. Like I did safari in the jungle with um, tiger tops and I trekked the Himalayas with mountain travel in Nepal. So I feel like those trips or those extended activities were like, and the Amazon. So I try to find, I try to write about stories like that too, because you can go to a wonderful place. And like I, people who are like, oh my God, I never have an itinerary. I just wake up. I find these great things. I have a lot of respect for that, but, like, when I'm left to my own devices, like, I'm only human. Sometimes I'm on Instagram. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to, like, to, no matter where you are in the world, if there's Wi-Fi and electricity, to disengage somewhat. So I found the moments where there's no Wi-Fi and no electricity really great. So those are amazing stories. Uh, I mean, I, I was meant to go to Kenya. This, this, um, this month was meant to be my trip to Kenya. I was meant to do a couple of other places in Africa. Uh, but you just sold it to me. Uh, I've got to go there as soon as it opens up. And Peru, I did do Peru myself a few years back and trekking up and just connecting with the locals and uh, you just have to do it. And um, when you did Peru, by the way, did you 
do the Inca track or did you do the Laris track? So I did the Asangate track. So I started oh, okay. and it was with REI and Andy and Lodges, REI Adventures. And Andy and Lodges is this boutique tourism industry. Okay, how do I describe this? You land in Cusco, you go out to the Sacred Valley. Then from the Sacred Valley, we took the Peru Rail and we did one, we did the Sungate track to Machu Picchu, which everyone should do because you get to Machu Picchu. Yeah. 4 p.m., you descend, the view is insane, and nobody's there. Like, my, like the Peruvian government and the Ecuadorian government, actually, if it's on South America, are really great with preserving their um, cultural landmarks. Like, it's not, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it, it really isn't crowded, even if you take the, you know, easy way up. But we started in Machu Picchu, and then we went up, and we started the Asangate track, and it's a lodge to lodge track to the highest lodges in the world. Like we were sleeping at 17,000 feet. Like we're going so high that like cars, cars don't drive, you know, there are no street lights, there's no cell phone service, there's no Wi-Fi. you know, planes don't fly up there. And when they, when the Peruvian um, tours, when the Peruvian government, like they were trying to figure out a way for these, for these communities in the central Andes, which have had the same sort of beautiful way of life for a very long time, but they live so high up, like you have to descend if you're giving birth. Like it's really, you're really up there. And the Andean Lodges, what it does is they partner with REI and the money that you spend on the trek goes directly to the communities. Mm -hmm. And all of the income is split equally around the communities, like above 15,000 feet. It's like an idyllic world of communism, in my opinion. But, you know, like they were able to build kindergartens. They were able to build women's clinics up there. And so you trek all day and pass the most insane things like red lagoons, like glacier valleys, deserts. And then at night, you know, you're welcomed by your Peruvian hosts who cook you this amazing meal. They give us amazing slippers as well. And it's just so fun. You know, and you drink Pisco Sours and it's lovely. And it's a seven day track. And then mm, eighth day. And then the eighth day, you get up to Rainbow Mountain, which like that itself is saved by tourism. Because I don't know if how many people are familiar with Rainbow Mountain, but it's the mountain in Peru. You've definitely seen pictures of it. It looks like it looks like someone like drew lines of sand of different mm -hmm. colors. Like it's all these different colors. It looks like an insane sand bottle created by like an impressionist artist. It's nuts. It doesn't look real. It's a very holy place for a Peruvian people, particularly for people who live in that, who live in the central Andes. And in the eighties or nineties, in a rare global misstep, Canadian miners were going to actually drill and mine into this, these mountains. And these people were like, how are we going to save this? And I actually met Rohair, like the minister of culture there. And he was like, we were like, okay, we need to let the world know. So they took out an ad in Etihad. I believe it was their Fly Etihad magazine. It just had a picture. It was called like Explore That and then a picture of Rainbow Mountain. And it said, do you know where this is? Essentially, if you do, you can fly there. We'll fly you there. They didn't even fly there. It was like oh, a partnership. Wow. And it went viral. And it got all this attention so that the miners like retracted their um, contract and they were able to save it. So that's an example of tourism doing good things like that whole track. You go to Rainbow Mountain and it's like breathtaking, but literally breathtaking because there are day trippers who come up from Cusco on the bus and they're in their like oxygen masks because it's not healthy to like ascend so high. But at that point, you know, oxygen wasn't necessary for me. So mm -hmm. that was like really beautiful. And that was actually my first time in South America. Mm, that's a lot. No, that was my second time. Last year, I never, weirdly never been to South America. And the past year I did the Amazon, the Galapagos and the, the Galapagos are also the Galapagos Ooh, are yeah. That's like walking into planet Earth. Like if you like sneak, like sea lions when you're snorkeling just come up and play with you. It's just like, it's so, it's so amazing. And I, Champy, oh my God, I will not remember his first name. His, he goes by Galapagos Champ because he knows everything about the Galapagos. Oh, okay. He's so charismatic. But I stayed at, Pica at Picaya Lodge, which has like a cruise that goes all around and it was just, Awesome. I just want to go to a viewer question, actually. There's a question from, well, there's a uh, comment from a guy called Dale. He's based in Boston. So when we're talking about the regulation, uh, not regulation, when you're talking about when people write subjective stuff online, um, he's put down, uh, it's a great point, zero regulation and oversight leaves it all open to, uh, open for propaganda. Uh, yeah. Which is actually a fair, a fair point. And that, you could find that, I think that part of that is happening right now with, and I have some friends who are influencers who are wonderful and they're really great. But you know, I guess I forgot what happened. In, there was like influencers doing money laundering in Kuwait. I read about that I think a week ago, but oh, uh, sometimes things are very spot. I know, Google it, it's a crazy story. Sometimes you have to worry, like I feel like that's why people try to be like, 
were you paid to be on the trip, you know? And like, mm. there is a lack of regulation and that's true. And that's why I also feel like heritage publications, you know, like an architectural digest or a business insider or anything kind of nasty, like there is more accountability for what you're reading. And even when I've researched trips, like I was going to Dominica, which I really recommend people go to. If you like nature at all, it's called the nature Island of the Caribbean. It looks like a mixture of like New Zealand and Yellowstone, if you can imagine that, on the Caribbean Sea. But I was reading, a, but I, I wasn't really looking at what I was reading. But I, and then halfway through, it was just like someone's blog about like their one unpleasant experience or trashing the whole country. And it, there's just no objectivity. Mm. And it's important for us as readers also to take a look at like, you know, this, the content, the stories we're reading, the content we're consuming. I know also like, a lot of the travel blogging sphere can just be a lot of white girls, which as a white girl, I mean, but I think with Black Lives Matter, two people are diverse, are showing like, look at who's telling the stories you're reading and, mm. you know, look at the stories, like who are they also catered to? So I think that there is a need for greater diversity and greater accountability in travel, but, and journalism, travel and journalism. But I think the issue is it's almost like teachers with writers, like very underpaid. So there isn't a lot of regulation yeah. there. It just isn't a lot of incentive either to be, on the up and up. But that being said, there are so many amazing journalists. I mean, for Forbes, I've profiled a ton of them. I did a 15 black travel writers to read now, all of whom like I've traveled with who are really amazing. But I've also interviewed travel writers about everything, you know, their favorite trips, their packing tips. And I recommend following, if you like a specific writer, particularly because so many writers are freelance, follow them across, you know, their different platforms. And sure. that's also a way of seeing, like, if you like someone's take on Jamaica, you'll probably enjoy, if you, you, if you have the same interest as someone, if you read their story and you're like, this is exactly what I'm looking for, and then you see they've written something else about, like, Sweden, you know, like, follow along with that, because travel is personal. And when you find a writer that's speaking to you and your interests, like, stay with them. Another question someone's asked, um, what are you writing about now? Obviously, if there's something that you can't tell us, obviously don't tell us. No, I'm writing a lot about Martinique, actually. And I'm also doing stories on the best road trips to take in the American West. So like this trip I just did from Jackson Hole to Big Sky and sort of profiling different trips you can take like in this part of the country. I mm. think that those stories are going to be really, and also I went to in New York, I think those stories like domestic travel is something I'm going to focus on more. And also like for skiing this winter, like if you like going to this place in Austria or this place in, Swiss in um, Switzerland, et cetera, like here's the American equivalent. This is from Dale again, he's from Boston. How hard was it making the change from a corporate America work life into a full-time journalism travel role? So for me, because I had really wanted to be a writer for so long, that my time, when I immediately started writing, I felt like fulfilled in a way that I never felt, particularly in working in media planning in corporate America. I didn't really care about toothpaste advertising. I also felt like this is a career where my natural personality, which can be kind of informal or chatty or I don't know, like I can stay up and write for almost days, like has, has been to my, been to a benefit for me. Like it was harder, quite honestly, for me to manage people and maintain that like professional distance. Like I feel like the people I work with, I grow close with and that's been helpful here. And just, if you love what you do, you're gonna find you're better at it. Cause you're, I don't need to pretend to be like, I met with this fish camp safari in Zambia this morning and I didn't have to pretend to be enthusiastic about it. You know, so I feel like passion comes through and I found that relationships are just as important in both industries. But I find that in the, in the journalism, it's almost even more important because you know, you're sort of in a constellation of tourism bureaus and editors and publicists and journalists and everyone works closely together. And if you go on one trip or you write about one trip really well and you got one story, that's going to stay with you. But what has been something that's been very different is that I miss going to work and having a couple of meetings and getting paid. You know what I mean? Like you have mm. to really balance out like the actual, a lot of the work you do, even though it's to service the stories you're able to write you're not actually compensated for. So that's something I've been doing this for two years and I feel like I'm finding the balance between like the amount that I wanna earn like, for everything that you definitely have to pay your dues at the beginning and you're doing a lot of unpaid work, which is why a lot of people don't go full time and quit their jobs until they sort of have something lined up. 
And for me, like, I moved out of my New York City apartment and I moved home temporarily with my parents because I was like, I just, if that was a risk I was willing to take. And I was like, well, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But I was talking to this guy, I forget his name, this was years ago on the Upper West Side, very successful freelance journalist and like obviously made a good amount of money. And he was like, if it, he's like, the more you're getting hired, the more you know it's working. Do you know what I mean? And I was like, well, what about these people who say they're artists, but they're trapped in a corporate job? And he's like, if you're really like, if it's something you really passionately feel like you want to do, you're going to do it and you're going to find a way to do it. So for people who want to be writers and want to break out on their own, almost now, I don't know, now we're all, you know, working from home. But <laughs> don't be, for me, I would beat myself up for not having been like a published travel writer by 22, 25. You know what I mean? Even 30. Mm. I didn't, if you had told me, Five years ago, I would be a travel writer talking to her, and I, I, wouldn't, I would have said no. So it's really just a matter of sort of having confidence in yourself. But for me, it was just like I was so sick of what I was doing that I was ready to push it. And maybe if I'd been better at my – if I cared more, then, you know, I would prefer the life I have now. But I see why it can be intimidating to make the jump. I, frankly, am always shocked that I was able to do it because I was so worried about it. But – the skills you learn in corporate America will help, like the professional website. Respond to, don't be, and here's another thing. Some journalists, some people think that like, particularly in travel, that like the way to like demonstrate their own worth as a journalist and as a travel professional is to sort of almost be like dismissive and condescending about things. Like, oh, mm. like I've been in Argentina five times. This other place was better. Or I'm above this type of like pitch or trip or what. Don't be above anything or anyone. And you're not. And if you, believe that then you're probably not a good traveler because i feel like what travel travel is a great equalizer but so just be as enthusiastic to the person who's emailing you about the jersey shore i'm from new jersey so i do love new jersey as <laughs> the person who's emailing you about an arctic about a trip to the arctic you know because that person it's very the industry moves around a lot and that person who's representing new jersey could suddenly next week be representing like bolivia or something so be friendly and be kind and that works I've got another question. Um, apologies if I'm pronouncing this wrong. It's from Isha Nishritha, Ishani. I think it's. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, she's written here, hey guys, I've got a question. I'm curious about how do you think traveling will change post-COVID? I do think that there's going to hopefully be an emphasis on more culturally responsible and environmentally sustainable travel. Because I do think one side effect of people being stuck at home is everyone's had to pause and slow down a bit. And obviously everyone's writing about like, oh, you know, there are suddenly birds in New York City on my window cell. But I do think that there's more of a general heightened awareness by the public. Hopefully also like culturally as well. I mean, with the protests that have happened with like Black Lives Matter and everything, I think that people are being, trying to be a little bit more responsible about, as we mentioned, the voices they consume, but also what is being locally, what's locally owned, what's not. I, it's been a trend for quite some time that people are not interested. And, in. like, it used to be, I want to stay at this Hilton. It was like a Starbucks latte. I could be in the Four Seasons in Hawaii, Singapore, Wyoming. It all feels the same. But a trend in travel is that people want to feel like they're in a unique, that they are mm. in a place that reflects where they're staying. And I think that goes hands in hands with locally owned. So hopefully that will be an emphasis too. For me, and this is my speculation, what I have seen and like just from my own personal experience, I'm, I'm quite well traveled, but I'm haunted by the trips that I didn't take, that I could have taken, that now I'm like, God, when will that ever happen again? If you always wanted to go hiking in the Himalayas, like you're not gonna wait another three years after it's available. You're probably gonna try to go as soon as possible because who knows what's gonna happen next. And I think that there are gonna be immense travel deals. Like I think when we can travel again, the tourism industry is hurting just as much as every other industry, at least like in the US badly. And people need people need travel for the economy for so I think that you're gonna be able to find you're going to be able to find amazing deals. And hopefully one thing I hope will stay the same is the flight cancellation or refund policies by airlines. Because right now you could book a flight to, I think it's like New Zealand for like $400 for six months from now. And if you have to reschedule, you can sort of reschedule indefinitely. And I think that that kind of flexibility is too rare in the travel industry. And like it causes a lot of people to sort of have like second, second thoughts about committing to something, particularly if you're going to go to, I mean, if you're going to go to South Africa and you want to plan out a two-week trip, you know what I mean? You want to be able to know now there's so much uncertainty in the world that if something does come up, you can reschedule. So hopefully airlines will become more humane.
Um, I just want to quickly ask you about um, when you sort of wine and dine, what, what do you like to do outside of your, your writing, your travels? Uh, how do you sort of relax? I love to socialize, which is really hard right now. Um, <laughs> I love to be, so, yeah, like, I mean, I like to, like, for fun, I feel like surrounded by, like, my friends, you know what I mean? Like, traveling, I guess that is traveling, but with friends, doing stuff outside, mm. reading, cocktail hour, <laughs> watching trashy television sometimes, reading a good book. Um, it's nice because a lot of, like, I feel like, as a writer, I am alone a decent amount. And I feel mm. like I have in my personality a mix between being really extroverted and a people person and then also being able, like I'm this week, I have a lot to write. So I'll just sort of retreat into a cocoon. So, but what's nice is that everything I like to do in my personal life, and I think this should be the goal of any career, like has become my profession in a way. Like all mm. of the trips that I do and all the stories that I write are about things that also interest me personally. And yeah. I do feel like, you know, the luxury adventure market is huge, but also like the friends travel market, because you'll always see stories about couples retreats or family vacations. But, you know, data shows that the people spending the most money on travel are 20 and 30 something women with disposable income and they're going as friends. And I've traveled with um, boyfriends and family, but I've also traveled with friends and those trips are the ones that I tend to consult more online or like figure because I'm the one who's planning it. So speaking to that audience too, like whether you're a consummate traveler who's been everywhere, sent, seen, like seen everything, and they're like, okay, I want to go to the Asiate track, or if you're someone who can travel once a year, but it's like you really like have to decide like which ones to go to, where you want to go, and what you want to do. Like speaking, serving that audience too, which is why I think roundups help. Like I did a ten bucket list trips for 2020, which I was one of my favorite stories because like all of those trips are just like literally mind blowing. What you said there about your personal life becomes your sort of work life because you enjoy it so much. Uh, I think that's, that keeps things, the, the fire burning, doesn't it really? Um, you know, you, mm. you're, you're doing something that you love doing and, um, you know, socializing with friends, you socialize when you go away, you know, all the sort of stuff, it sort of all marries in together, doesn't it really? That's what I think. think. Yeah, I um, think travel writing is something, you, it's helpful to be a people person because not everyone yeah. is. And obviously you can write an amazing story without k making a friendship with a local. But for me, what I found is that like the people are always the place. And had I not, you know, and it's easy to like people act like, and it is big, it is a dream job, but it is mm. work too. And like, I remember I was in Barbados and it was like the 13th Island and maybe like three weeks and I was dead tired. And then, you know, I was talking to my, um, to my, to my guy, Derek Morgan, who's amazing, who everyone should everyone should find out in Barbados, but we were chatting and then part of me was like wanting to disengage. And then it's like, no, you have to say yes. Like go to the fish fry, go to the second location, go to the third location. And maybe that can be a little bit dangerous to say yes to everything. I've been very lucky. Um, but yeah, like the more to quote Bill Murray, like I try to be available for life to happen to me. Thank you for coming on and uh, telling us your story. Uh, fascinating. I could literally talk to you forever because <laughs> we just have so much to talk about, but uh, I have to call it a day there. But uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, hopefully you'll continue your success. Thank you. And thank you guys for all of your insightful questions. It's nice to see some friends from around the world too. Thank you for coming on again. And uh, we'll speak very soon. Perfect. Bye guys. Take care. It was a wonderful talk and if you want to get in touch with Catherine and stay in contact with her, you can visit her website which is www.catherineparkermagier.com That's it for Take Your One No Shebs. Hope to see you all very soon. Until next time, bye for now.